It's our opening scripture, Bryn. For as he thinketh, so is he. Proverbs 23 and 7. Sabrina, or uh, I think it's on clear. Can you uncheck clear for me so I can use this? Sabrina, if you could just, I think I have it on clear on accident. I know. I, I had it all ready to go because... And then I accidentally uh, forgot to do clear. But we're Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And last, the last part we talked about anxiety. And we, we tackled something that plagues so many people. And uh, we talked about a key, you know, peace of God and the steps that you have to do. And, and it's not just a one thing, but and then what you can do and how you keep that hedge around you. And we're going to travel along the same road tonight, but with a different subject. And that's henceforth my title, Paralyzed in Life. Now, we won't be talking about anxiety, but we will be talking about something else that... We have uh, not the greatest understanding about, and we do, but then we miss it, and there's so much more to it when you dig into Scripture. And I opened last time with people who are so used to losing, they just wake up already with loss in their mind. And they wake up every day with this expectation of, I was a mistake yesterday, I'm going to be a mistake today. I'm not going to change. I'll be a mistake tomorrow. And we have these people who, who battle this mindset. And, and, and they get labeled this. And they get put in that category. And they think that is who they are supposed to be. And they have this pattern that they follow. And they have an idea that becomes such a core belief of them. And, and we have people... All around us, you pass by them in the grocery store, you, you see them while pumping gas, and you, you have all these people who look good on the outside, but inside they don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. and They don't know how to do what they need to do, and, and they're just stuck. And we have people who are so used to losing that if they get a win, they would forfeit it because it's abnormal to them, and they wouldn't think that they deserve it. and So they, they forfeit anything good and they just take all the bad. And a lot of times these people are the ones who just take from people and take from people and allow people to use them and, and use them. And, and it's just, that's just their norm. And some people fight this subconsciously. Some people don't even know they're doing it. Some people are fully aware that they're doing it. So there's... Two people, and some of them are just dealing with the hand that they've been dealt with from life. Because life happens. Okay? You, maybe the upbringing wasn't what it should have been and didn't function what the upbringing should have been. And, and your family's sins are, are now manifesting in your life. And, and it's no fault of your own. But now you have to deal with repercussions and decisions that were made that you didn't even know you were aware. And, and we often fight things, and we don't even know why we're fighting them. And, and we're like, I didn't sow for this, but yet I'm reaping it. And, and we have this pattern that, that we get to. And regardless whether it's decisions that you made and you're reaping the consequences of a bad decision or you had nothing to do with this and now you're trying to deal with it. At the end of the day, it does not matter. Because at the end of the day, you have a choice. Now that choice always needs to be considered by one thing, because that choice does not end with you. There's always someone connected to you, and when you get pulled, they get pulled. And the best example I have is, you had children in their cribs and you have that carousel thing and if you pull one, they all move. And, and that's what happens is we think that our decisions and things that we do 
only affect us, but they actually affect everyone connected to you. And what I don't want to do is, last time we talked about anxiety, and we're going to talk about something else tonight, what I don't want to do is what the church has done typically. Typically, religion will do this. If you're fighting this, let's get hyper-spiritual, grab some oil, and cast the thing out. The problem is you don't always have to cast the thing out. You only cast a demon out, and sometimes it's not a demon. Sometimes it's not a demonic force. Sometimes there are problems that have nothing to do with an adversary. We have chemical imbalance that are very real. We have things that happen in our body and in life to where a function of our brain doesn't develop like it should. And, and there are things that we deal with that are just natural. And I remember when I was in college, I did a paper that fascinated me. Is I was trying to, I put a paper together about predicting behavior. And I wanted to see if you can predict someone before they committed a crime. So we did, I think it was a class, I think it was a project with us three, so we researched and researched, and we come to find out that there was a site neuro, neurologist that had that same idea. He's like, why do people do bad things? Are they truly wired differently? So he dug into that, that realm, and he actually went and took convicted felons, and he took quote unquote normal people who weren't in prison and he did brain scans and come to find out that the 21 criminals actually had a function in their brain that never developed as a baby and this function was actually the switch that says good or bad this function was hey this is a bad thing to do don't do this or hey they didn't have that it didn't develop so he's seen okay these people truly maybe didn't know what they were doing. So I, I don't want to be hyper-spiritual and do what the church always does and say, if you are fighting this, you need to come down to an altar, get some oil, and you need to just rebuke the thing out. Because that's not always the case. But that's what we've taught. We're taught if we're fighting something, well, it must be a devil and he must be after us. That, that's not true. Natural things happen. And that's where I want to take us with our subject. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Remember, that is a lowercase s. But the power of, a, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And then we'll go to 1 John. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. And our last scripture should be Proverbs. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Now, what was the common thread between these three scriptures? Fear. fear. Fear was the common thread between these three scriptures. Now, what we, is do, what we do as Christians, as the church, is we read this scripture as it is, and we say, okay, fear. And then we take this word fear, and we encapsulate it and manifest everything inside this one thing, and we make it a holistic word, and Fear is just fear, and you shouldn't have it because it's bad. But that's a wrong concept. It's not true. Because there's good fear, believe it or not. Yes, there, is. there is good fear. And now, we've gotten this idea about fear from the songs that we sing. And, but there's a natural fear in us that God gave us. It's a feeling that God gave us. God gave you a fear. Okay? When you're walking outside and you hear a rattle of a baby rattle and you look around and there's no baby, you start to get fearful because, oh, hold up. There's danger somewhere nearby me. 
that feeling is fear. And that fear is telling you, be careful. Because you just heard something that is danger and it is close. And that fear needs to tell you, be alert. You have to watch where you're walking. That, that's a good fear. That's not bad. When a decision needs to be made, fear can be a good thing. Because fear can help you steer clear from a terrible decision. It could, if you're doing this, if, okay, well, I need to jump off a cliff. But the fear gets you and say, well, that's kind of high. That's not a bad fear. That's saying, look, there may be consequences to this. You need to be very careful with what action you take. And then you have, pastor always did this to us growing up. You have, always, you have this what if. You know, and that's a good fear. What if, what if all the time, all the time, pastor, we would go to do something. My brother would go to do something. I would go to something. And he said, but what if this happens? Dad, that's one in a million. I know, but what if? What if? See, that's a fear. But it's good fear because it's making you think, okay, there may be something I'm missing. Now, I didn't do a lot of stupid things as a child because I was fearful to do them. So fear kept me from doing a lot of stupid things. So fear is a good thing. Okay, there is a natural fear that God has given you, has instilled in you. That's good. It's an alert. It says, hey, danger close by. Whenever you have two scriptures that seem like they battle each other because you can kind of look at these two New Testament scriptures and you can look at the Old Testament scriptures and you can... It kind of, because you can go to Proverbs 9.10, and Proverbs 9.10 says, I should have it. Yeah, it was up there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But we just read two scriptures that said fear's bad. Right? So, so when you see something like that, you're like, okay, hold up. All right, we can, this is Old Testament we got to go to New Testament. But you can't do that because the Old Testament is the foundation for the New Testament. And there are still things that apply in the Old Testament that we live out in the New Testament. So when you see something, you're like this, all right, so the fear of the Lord is the beginning. Well, I'm just, just told I'm not supposed to have fear. But this scripture says that it's the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. We must understand the context and define it. Now, we've not done some Greek study or Hebrew study, so we're going to do some tonight. So you have two scriptures, New Testament. You had 2 Timothy 1 and 7, and then you had 1 John 4 and 18, both New Testament. Then you had an Old Testament scripture. Now, we read that word fear. Is that fear the same in those scriptures? Is that word fear the same definition in those scriptures? So if they're different, we read them the same. It says fear. It says fear. So what's the definition of these fears? 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says... For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now the word fear there in the Greek is dilea. Dilea is the Greek word used there. Dilea. While 1 John 4.18 uses the word phobos. But we read them as two words, fear. But in the Greek, they're two different words. I wonder if they have two different meanings. So you have two different words in the Greek, but one English word. 
So let's start with 1 John 4.18. Phobos. Phobos means to fear or dread that which strikes terror. Now this derives from the word phobomai. To be put in fear, to be alert, or to be afraid of. That's the definition of 1 John 4 and 18. So let's read, now that we know the definition of this scripture. There is no fear. Well, we know the definition now. There is no fear. There's no alarm. There's no fright. You shouldn't be afraid, according to 1 John. But perfect love casteth out fear, torment. You sh you're afraid. That's, that's that one. Then we can go to Proverbs 9.10. And the word fear here, remember this is Old Testament, so it's Hebrew, not Greek, is yurah. Now this Hebrew, Hebrew word has the same meaning as the Greek word that we're about to talk about. Dylea, or Dylea is the same one used in 1 John. So you have an Old Testament fear, New Testament fear, and they're the same meaning. Same meaning. One's just Old Testament, one's Hebrew, one's Greek. It has the same definition, but in Proverbs 9.10, it adds a definition to it. And the definition is awesome or terrifying thing or object. Or to respect God. And it adds that. It's the same meaning. To be fearful, to alarm, to fright, to be afraid of. But then it adds a different definition. It says it's awesome or it's terrifying thing or object to respect God. So now we know what 1 John 4 and 18, what the word fear means in that one. We know what Proverbs 9, 10 now we can move to 2 Timothy 1 and 7, because that's what I want to focus on. Because we read spirit, lowercase s, spirit of fear. Not a generalization word, fear, but the spirit of fear. Now this word... Phobos is the one in 1 John 4, 18. Phobos and Ura. Okay, those two mean the same thing. 2 Timothy is Dylea. I was down a paragraph. Dylea. Dylea. That means timidity or cowardice. So what does timidity mean? Because that's the actual word used there in the Greek. It means lack of courage or confidence. When you get word, intimidation comes from timidity. So intimidation, we get that word from timidity. means lack of courage or confidence. So the Bible specifies a handful of spirits throughout the Bible. Specifies them and calls them out by name. Doesn't do it with every, all of them, but he does it with a few. One of them is the spirit of fear. So when we read 2 Timothy 1 and 7, but we change the context, we get a better picture of what it's meaning. For God hath not given us the spear of timidity. God has not given us the spirit of intimidation. Yeah, you can. It's 2 Timothy. Yeah. yeah, just click on it and go live. Or you could double click on the scripture there on the, yeah. Sabrina's coming. I planned on drawing it on the board, but the board was taken to the shed. So, uh. For God hath not given us the spirit of, spirit of fear. not fear. That's the wrong word. It's actually timidity. 
intimidation, cowardice. That's, that's truly the true definition, not fear. Because we've seen what fear means in the other two scriptures. This is a different word. It's not truly fear, it's timidity. For God hath not given us the spirit of timidity, but the power of love and a sound mind. So God doesn't give us the spirit of intimidation. So if God doesn't give it to us, then that means that spirit must come from somewhere else. That spirit must come from the spirit of darkness, from the kingdom of darkness. Because God said, I won't give this to you, insinuating and saying, hey, this spirit's out there and it's not of me. I won't give this to you. I won't intimidate you. I won't make you a coward and cower down. So what is intimidation? What, what, we, we know what kind of intimidation is, but to intimidation is you are so convinced you, are, you will lose, you don't try. What has our opening been? We have people who wake up daily and they don't try because they know they'll lose. Because they have the spirit of timidity. They have the spirit of intimidation. Intimidation says, look, I'm going to intimidate you in such a way that you won't even fight. Intimidation is a mind game. It sure is. Sports is the perfect example of intimidation. Because if your opponent intimidates you enough, you will either not play or you will play poorly because they've gotten in your head. And if you've lost in your head, it's game over if you've lost up here. And that's what our introduction been. What people are, they have anxiety, but they also have the spirit of intimidation. Because they wake up and say, I'm a mistake, there's no point in trying. And so we have this spirit that's plagued us. People are fearful, and meaning they have intimidation going on inside of them. And they're giving in before it's even started. It's, I'm not going to start this because I know I won't finish it. It's, I'm not going to strive for that because I know I will fail. And they have the spirit of intimidation. This spirit of timidity. They're scared to try because they've already lost in their mind. I'm not going to save this relationship because I know it can't be repaired. The spirit of timidity. They don't try to fix it because they've already made up in their mind that it won't be fixed and it can't be fixed. I'm not going to reach lost family members because I know they cannot be saved. You don't try because you already have it made up in your mind that it won't end the way it will end the way you think it will. And it always starts off small. Always. And these are huge items we're talking about. They don't start off this way. It starts off with something small, and you don't even recognize it as fear. You don't recognize it as intimidation. You, you kind of justify it as, well, this might, I think this is pointless to me. And I don't, I don't see me needing to do this because... I, I'm going to succeed anyway. And, and you kind of battle it in your mind without trying because you're scared to try. And it, it starts off small. But eventually it will get to the point to where the spirit of timidity will get a hold of a big thing and make you fail before you've even started. And we have fear. We have anxiety. We talked about it last time. We have depression. We have all these things that we face in life. And these things are not always demonic forces. They're not. Because like we talked about early, there are chemical imbalance. There are things that happen to our brain, concussions that can cause something that won't start off as demonic. 
But if you don't get a hold of it quickly, it will be an open door for the adversity to come in and set up a stronghold in your mind. So it may not start off as a demonic force. It doesn't all the time. Sometimes it starts off as it's just a natural. Our bodies get older. Things happen. But it's when you ignore it, then the enemy sees an entry point. You open the door. They can't open the door. You open the door and they see the entry point. So then they take advantage of that opening. And that's when, that's when we get the spirit of fear, the spirit of anxiety, the spirit of depression and and it comes in and just makes things worse. And now you're no longer just fighting a natural emotion. But now you're fighting a principality. You're fighting something else in the spiritual realm. And when it comes to these emotions and feelings, it's always important that you have an understanding of where they came from. Because like I said, we fight things and we don't know where they came from. And we're swinging at an enemy blindfolded because we don't know how to attack said enemy. Because we don't know where they came from. And you may get rid of a few fruit here and there, but you aren't getting to the root. So if you know the origin of what it came from, then you can go to the source and get rid of it. So it's very important that you understand where did this come from. Was this a decision I made? Was this something my family caused? But in the same aspect, there are clinical applications in which your body does not function as it should. So it's not a hyper-spiritual come to the altar and get some anointing and rebuke a devil. Because you can do that and walk out the same way. Well, if you're buking something and it don't buke, that means it's not a devil means you're dealing with something different. You could be dealing with God, thorn in the side or a hip socket. God could be causing it. Or it could be your own actions. And buking your own actions, you don't buke your own actions. It doesn't work like that. You only buke devils. And we have this going on and, and it's all a mindset all a mindset as a man thinketh sometimes you're fighting a natural thing sometimes you're fighting a spiritual thing understand what you are fighting because you're for fighting a natural thing you are going to approach it differently than you would a spiritual thing you're not going to approach a spiritual thing the same way a natural thing is because it doesn't they work on two different realms So if you have this, then you need to take medicine A. You don't take medicine B for symptom A. You take medicine A for, it's the same way. You need to understand, all right, is this spiritual? Or is this natural? And you have to understand because if you can understand it, you can equip yourself better and combat it with everything that you have. So you have this thing and you have the kingdom of darkness and it's entered because you've opened a door and it didn't start off that way and it was natural and you have an issue with your body and, and now it seized you and it's crippled you with intimidation because it's entered your life and now you feel you can't do A, B, and C because of this fear. And that, that's kind of how you can start to recognize Okay, is this natural or is this spiritual? Because if it's spiritual, it will start gripping on to, to other things in your life. It will be the spirit of intimidation where you don't even want to go out anymore. And you just want to be secluded. And you don't want to do that anymore. And, and you're scared to do. And it starts infecting more areas in your life. That's when you know it has been spiritual. But if it's just a one thing, it's probably not. It's probably natural. But when it starts to spread and spread, and before you know it, you're like, oh, hold on here. This, I'm having chaos in all these areas of my life. 
Why is this happening? What is going on? And one thing turns into two things, and two things turn into four things, and four things turn into eight things, and so on, and it gets worse. That's when you know it's demonic. But if it's not, the spirit of fear is not your child choking. That is not a demonic presence. That is a fear of your child. It is not a demonic presence when you have a dog barking behind a fence with its teeth growling. With him. That's not the spirit of fear. That's not intimidation. That's good because that's what God gave you. It's, look, danger. You should probably go somewhere else, go a different direction. He didn't give you the spirit of intimidation, though. He didn't say, I give this to you. Because if you don't try, then you won't have nothing. That's not what God, that's the spirit of intimidation. That's the spirit of fear. When you do something or you don't do something and don't even try because you're so convinced, what, this isn't worth it to me. I'm not even going to bother because I know what's going to happen. So then you have this timidity thing. And we have this better concept now because it's not just really talking about fear like First John is in Proverbs. It's not talking about that. There's this acronym I heard for fear. I don't know how. It, it's pretty true, and I, I heard it, and I was like, you know what, that's pretty good. So there's this acronym of fear, and it's called False Evidence Appearing Real. Fear, false evidence appearing real. So let's, let's open that box up. Let's put it on the table and open it up. Okay, when you get information regarding something, the spirit of fear, the spirit of timidity paralyzes you because you think it's real in your eyes. But what is real to you is not truth. There are facts, and there is information supporting what is facts, what is this. And, and you have something that says, look, this is very real. I have a doctor's note. I have this, and this is real in this realm. And you can't deny that it's real, but it's not factual. John seventeen seventeen. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay. All right, so we know what truth is. God's word is truth. Okay, well, okay so now we know that. So we can look, and Susie's the perfect example. Fact is, fact is, she had breast cancer. It's a fact. Doctor's reports. Images. Fact is, she had it. That's factual. It, there's evidence supporting the claim. Almost a year ago. Fact is, it's there. But that's not the truth. Because the truth is Isaiah 53.5. But he was wounded for our transgressions and was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are not going to be healed. We will not eventually be healed. We are healed. Fact is, yes, this is, this is factual, but this truth overrides that claim. Because his word is truth. His word yields a higher level of authority than facts. If God's word is true and truth is higher of a higher level of facts, that means when you bring truth into the mix, the facts change. They have no choice but to change because you have a higher level of authority telling it this is not it you will change because i am telling you to change <clears throat> K 
Can you take the truth of what God said you would be and apply it to the facts of your life? Can you have the mindset that is so determined nothing will stop you? Can you take the facts that you've been given in life You've been labeled that. You've been categorized that. You have this in your life. Could you take these facts, get the truth of God's word, and apply it to those facts? Because those facts have no choice but to change. Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good, and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt, and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. Every spirit has fruit. Every single spirit. We know the fruit of the spirit, capital S, the fruit of the spirit, right? Remember, it's singular, not plural, not fruits. It's not fruits, it's fruit, singular, not plural. We know what Galatians 5 says about the fruit of the Spirit, which means every spirit has fruit. So if every spirit has fruit, that means you don't have to look very hard to see what spirit you have manifesting on your tree. And here's the thing, the fruit will never lie to you. Your fruit will never lie. You can look at the roots, you can look at the trunk, you could look at the bark, you could look at the leaves, you can look at the twigs. And that may not tell you what kind of tree it is, but you can always look at the fruit and it will never lie to you because it will reveal itself to you by the fruit it has. So you will never go up to an orange tree and say, those apples look really good. It's impossible. The orange tree is telling you, this is my identity. This is what I have. So you don't go up to it and say, I want an apple because it's not an apple tree. And people are the same way. See, people try to mask and hide the fruit of their tree. They try to hide the spirit that they have. They may not know they have it. They may know they have it. They may not. But subconsciously, they're going to try and hide it. But they forget that the fruit is hanging from it. And all you have to do is look at the fruit And understand the source of the origin. So if the spirit, if the fruit of the spirit we know, then that means that the fruit of fear, the fruit of timidity, I'm sorry, the spirit of fear, the spirit of timidity must have fruit that you can see. Because every spirit has fruit. So what fruit is produced by the spirit of fear or timidity? First one, failure to make a decision or making a rash decision. Now, there's times where the fear is a good thing, right? I know not to jump off the bridge because I'm scared of what may happen. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about God divine purpose. We're talking about, okay, I felt that the Lord told me to go pray with someone, but I'm too scared to do it. That's the spirit of intimidation. That's what we're talking about. Failure to make a decision or you make a rash decision. Because you're scared and you're fearful so you don't think about it and you just act. Second one, insomnia. We're so scared to go to bed because of what we know we're going to fight when we try to go to bed. Or we can't sleep because of what may come. So we have this spirit of intimidation because we're not sure what will happen. Third, this is going to be, what? Anxiety and depression. 
because more spirits will come along and manifest in fruits that you have. Four, anger. We often lash out in anger to put fear at ease because when we're lashing out, we don't feel our, we don't feel our fear. It seems not so bad when we can focus on someone else and attack them. And just like everything in life, you have seasons of cycle. There's patterns in your life, and they repeat. Some of them are out of the norm, and you're like, man, this is kind of weird. I don't, this is, this is a weird season. This was a weird cycle. And then you see it again, and you're like, I remember this. And then you see it again. You have got to pay attention to those things. Because there is a cycle happening that you are not aware of. And you must attack that cycle so it stops repeating itself. Because it will keep repeating, growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Until it does something that's like, I can no longer ignore this anymore. <coughs> the, fear, the spirit of fear has people paralyzed about what tomorrow will bring. They're scared. They're intimidated. They have this thing that's, I, I'm too scared to just walk in and I can't do that. And fear has you anticipating what may happen in the future. That's fear. Fear doesn't deal with your past. Fear always deals with future. And you know what the opposite of fear is? The opposite of fear is depression because they work hand in hand but depression doesn't focus on future depression focuses on past and present so they work hand in hand because you have fearful you're fearful about the future but you're depressed in today because of your past you won't be depressed for your future that's fear but they work hand in hand they're going the same direction in a sense but looking at two different things There are feelings, and we wake up every day worried of what, to, what today will bring. And we're scared to, I don't know if about this, and I'm scared that my boss is going to do this, and I don't know how this situation is going to turn out, and, and I don't even want to deal with this. And we have this spirit of intimidation because we were like, you know what, let's just not even deal with it because I'm scared of what the consequences may be. And these are all feelings, too. Fear is a feeling. Anxiety and depression, it's a feeling. Now, here's the key. Here's the key. When these feelings come up, feelings don't just show up. They don't just manifest and you just feel. Feelings always, always accompany a thought always so what are your thoughts when these things come up feelings are not natural your feelings are, aren't just a natural thing that just happened it doesn't you don't just instantly feel this way there's always something that will manifest the feeling it's always a thought. It's always up here. This is not how, that's not how feelings work. Fe you don't just randomly, I'm scared all of a sudden. That feeling manifests because of a thought. And that thought manifests the feeling, and now you're battling a thought and a feeling. So, what are your thoughts? What have we been talking about? Mind management. If you have bad feelings, it's because you have bad thoughts. Period. You don't just randomly get bad thoughts or bad feelings. They always, your feelings always accompany a thought. As a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh. 
So is he. Mind management. What are your thoughts? Now, this is very important. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm closing up, but don't, don't tune me out, okay? Because this, this last part is extremely important. Okay, I built everything up for this. If you meditate on a thought long enough, we know it, it will always accompany a feeling. But that's not all it does. If you meditate on it long enough, if you meditate on the feeling long enough, you have just now given that feeling dominion in your life. Now, what are the repercussions of letting that feeling have dominion in your life? If you've given that feeling dominion, you will be enslaved to it because you won't be able to function outside of said feeling. So if you let fear have dominion in your life, everything you do, you will be fearful in. You'll be fearful in eating a hamburger. You'll be fearful if you have the feeling of depression. Everything you do will manifest that feeling because it's been allowed to have dominion in your life. Now you, now you see the enemy and say, okay, I see that they are ruled by this feeling and the door is wide open for me to come in and set up another stronghold and make more spirits come in and let them have dominion. That's why it's very important what you meditate on. It's very important what feeling you let enter your body. 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. We all know this scripture. But we need to extract something that maybe we've not seen before. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds are not external. He's not talking about spiritual forces out in the air. He's talking about a mindset. Okay? Mindset. Stronghold. What's a stronghold? It's a belief system. It's an idea that's manifested itself as a philosophy. It's a stronghold. It's an I, something you believe in. Verse 5. Casting down. You must take the thought and cast it down. When the thought enters your mind, if you cast it out, you say this is not from God. And I plead the blood over this thought right now. Because this thought has no place in this temple. But you have to cast it down. You have to understand it's there and acknowledge that it's there. Casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth its... What does exalt mean? To place high above everything else. And that's what we're doing it against. Because you have the thought and you exalt the thought higher than the things of God. You exalt the pain, the hurt, the torment. You exalt that above God. Every high thing exalteth itself against, this is important, the knowledge, the knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God? His word. His truth. Not the facts, but his word. 
So when you get the thought of what if this sickness comes back, you have the choice to exalt that thing above the truth of God. You have that choice. You have the thought of, I am not special and no one cares about me. You have the choice to exalt that above, I am a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy. You have the choice to exalt that above what the truth says. What thoughts do you exalt above the truth? The knowledge, the word of God. What thoughts are you putting higher than what God says? And then finishing that verse. And bringing into captivity every... What? Every... Thought, because it starts with the thought. To the obedience of, forget about Christ, the anointing. Because Jesus isn't in this text that says Christ, which means it's referring to the anointing. So you put every thought of obedience on the anointing. What are your mindset? What is your mindset? What are you thinking about? Are you feeling a certain way? If you are, what are your thoughts? Do you have the spirit of timidity? Are you scared to do things because you're too scared of what may happen? Are you intimidated by the spirit and choose not to pursue the purpose God has for you? So, but it's all about the purpose. It's, it's all about God's destiny for you. And if you're too intimidated to go forth, you will never pursue what he has planned for you. As we say, stand. <laughs> Mindset, guys. Mindset. Mind management. Mind management. Okay, so something happens. Something happens. Take a step back and say, hold on. Hold on here. All right, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to look at this from a different lens. I'm going to look at this from a different viewpoint. Is this, does this what I'm seeing, is this going against what God says? Okay, I got to compare the two. That's why you need to know your word. You're not going to know what God says if you don't know the word. So you have to know what he says to battle the thoughts. So you, you have this thing come up and you're like, okay, is this from God? Can I, is this scriptural? Is this truth or is this facts? If this is facts, then I need to go find the truth. And I need to put the truth and exalt that above the facts. Because the fact has no choice but to change. That's a law that was put in That's a principle. Greater authority yields to lesser authority. That's, it's a law. Period. Doesn't matter who you are. What are the thoughts? What, what are you thinking about? You wake up every day. Do you wake up happy or do you wake up sad? Well, if you wake up sad and you meditate on it, then your day is probably going to be pretty crummy. But if you wake up happy and joyful, say, this is the day that the Lord has made. And no matter what comes my way, I will rejoice. And it doesn't matter what comes because you will say, God's got it. God was already here. He knew this was going to happen.
What is your mindset about your family? What is your mindset about relationships? What is your mindset about church? What is your mindset about a career? What is your mindset about people? What is your mindset about the world? What is your mindset about a nation? What, what are the thoughts that you are meditating on? And if you ever have a feeling come up, you need to understand what was I thinking to make said feeling come up. And then you take that thought and you cast it on the anointing. You let the anointing take care of it. You take God's word, God's truth, and you apply it. And you hold on to the word. No matter what you see, just like Peter, just like the woman with the issue of blood, the woman sustained her word. Peter did not. 